ritual in my life was my dad leaving for Casper, Wyoming for six weeks as he led a summer geology field trip for his geology students. I don't remember how young I was when it started, but it definitely continued through eighth grade. For me, as a child, there were, of course, very mixed emotions. I would definitely miss my dad while he was away, but part of me looked forward to his leaving. This was because his authority would be gone. The household would be a little less strict. I could get away with more. The punishments would be less severe. Of course, by a certain point, I'd be looking forward to when my dad would get back. A few weeks in, and I would begin to miss him. And there was always the ritual of him bringing back some sort of treat for me. When I was nine, he brought back the video game Parsec for our Texas Instruments com home computer. It was a really cool game for 1983. It even had synthesized speech. That doesn't sound like much today, but in the early 80s, that was rarefied cool. I'd look forward to the treat, too, but not as much as seeing my dad. There'd be all kinds of things I'd want to tell him, and of course, I'd probably chatter his ear off when he arrived home, tired from a long six weeks of field work and the drive back from Casper, Wyoming to northeastern Ohio. But imagine how sad it would be for both me and for my dad if all I cared about or wanted was the video game and not seeing him. Today we look at a passage from Mark that highlights Jesus' authority. Jesus' authority is something that at times we, like a nine-year-old boy, may not want around. After all, the allure of being our own masters can be tempting. Other times, we may want Jesus' authority around for the wrong reasons. We want the gift. We want health. We want Jesus to rescue us from stressful situations. We want Jesus to get us up out of the muck, muck we are in. But Jesus' authority is not dependent upon our whims. God has ultimate authority. God's ultimate authority or as some would say, sovereignty, is one aspect of God. And it is a very important aspect. But we cannot lose sight that God is love and that God the Son is the divine reason, what John calls in his gospel the Word or the Logos. We should not distort God to elevate his authority to be his sole defining characteristic, that is a problem with misconceptions about God. A lot of times they overemphasize one thing about God to the expense of other aspects. Muslim extremists view Allah ultimately as being will. Whatever Allah wills, we do. So if Allah tells us to fly planes into buildings, we do it. Some Christians in the USA are in danger of the same thing when they emphasize God's will over his reason and love. Hence, doing things that make no sense, like marching around Washington DC seven times in hopes that the Capitol building will fall down. Does the author of the universe who created all things deny reason so that an Alex Jones InfoWars informed quasi-spirituality lead our actions. I'm sure a lot of people devoutly marched around Washington, D.C. during the Jericho mar marches with the belief that God willed them to do that. To be clear, if God wills you to do something, you do it. But we need to be discerning that we are following the true God of the universe who has revealed himself in scripture and not a God from some other book or a God we've distorted. So we turn to scripture to gain a picture 
of God's authority. God's authority neither exists to grant our wishes nor tell us to do unreasonable things couched in conspiracy or evil. God's authority exists because God is God. It is who he is, and he exerts it out of his good character. It orders the world, draws many to God. It blesses us and shows good to all creation. Most of all, he uses his authority to reveal himself to all creation, that all creation may enjoy him. And so today we look at, at Jesus' authority. Most of us have problems with control or authority, if we are honest about ourselves. Just think of the wrong pictures of authority we have. The impulsive person who orders things to be done on whims, or the authoritarian, or the political hero that gives good gifts in return for power. Just as we have seen authority wrongly displayed, we too are in danger of wrongly receiving authority. Again, there can be rejection of authority, or there can be the desire to see authority exerted to meet our own whims, or there can be the desire to follow authority blindly, even when it is senseless. But if Jesus gave us the gift we wanted, or turned his back on our indiscretions at our whims, would he really have ultimate authority? And who would Jesus be if he exerted authority on whim? Certainly not the God revealed throughout the scriptures. Today's passage shows us that Jesus does have ultimate authority. His authority comes from God the Father. And his authority is for our ultimate good. But Jesus' ultimate authority means two things. When it is in our lives, first, it gives us ultimate good, but secondly, it means we cannot expect Jesus to do whatever we desire. Jesus has ultimate authority over all creation. This passage contains several vignettes that display both these qualities of his authority. We see several instances of need arise. Jesus heals sicknesses, or casts out demons. We see a continuation on the theme that demons cannot reveal who Jesus is. Imagine reading a novel. Could you imagine the author painstakingly writing the novel, slowly revealing the plot to you, the reader? Now imagine some jerk wrote in the margins of the first few pages all the spoilers to the plot of the novel. If the author cared about you, the reader, and their work that they were conveying to you, what would the author do if they had power? They'd silence those scribblers. Jesus has authority in situations in front of him to heal, to cast out demons, and to uh, silence those annoying demonic plot spoilers from ruining his story the one he is revealing to us. Jesus is not some traveling miracle worker who performs a show. Rather, he has ultimate authority, and the authority expresses itself when it sees need. So they come home on Sabbath from the synagogue. They enter Simon Peter's home. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. Jesus has authority. So he heals. This is a private healing, and Jesus is trying to have private time with his disciples at Peter's home. Word of Jesus has spread. Earlier in the day at the synagogue, he taught as one who had authority. He cast out a demon, and word traveled. It's evening. The Sabbath ended at sundown. Now a huge crowd from the entire town gathers at the door of Peter's home. Many are sick and debilitated. Some have demons. How does authority express itself? 
authority to heal, and authority to cast out demons, again, is on full display publicly. But Jesus will not let the demands of the crowd have authority over him. He is not the cosmic wish fulfillment center. As good as healing is, as good as having a huge following in one town is, this is not his mission. His mission is the inauguration of the kingdom of God. And while it is true that healing and casting out of demons go part and parcel with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is greater. When the kingdom of God is fully inaugurated, all these many smaller good things will be experienced in full. Imagine no need of healing because there is no sickness, no sin, no ugliness. A time when we will dwell with Jesus, drinking from the water of life and eating from the tree of life. But none of that will happen if Jesus does not proclaim the kingdom, does not confront Jerusalem, and does not confront death and sin on the cross. The good, a healing here and there, must take second seat to this greater mission. And so what does Jesus do? He displays his authority by not allowing the good to hijack the perfect. He keeps to his agenda. He departs the village of Capernaum to a deserted place. It is very early in the morning. He prays to the Father, God the Father who has sent Jesus on his mission, God the Father who has given all authority to the Son. Jesus prays to his Father. And when the disciples arrive, led by Simon Peter, their first word is, Everyone. Everyone wants Jesus. Perhaps they want more healing. Perhaps they want more miracles. What do they want from Jesus? These miracles are like little bags of candy tossed. And that's all the people are inclined to want because that's all they know. But these little bags of candy are only a pointer to something far greater that Jesus alone has the authority to accomplish. He wants to give us the greatest banquet in a permanent house that will be ours, a permanent mansion. But we far too often want the Tootsie Roll. But there is something even... So the question is, do we want Tootsie Roll or banquet? But there is something even greater than the banquet in the mansion, Jesus. Jesus, God who is with us. Again, the miracle may be the video game offered to the nine-year-old. The mansion may be the video game offered to the nine-year-old as well. They are both gifts. Gifts point to the giver. Ultimately, we are to look to the giver of all good things. But Jesus has his own agenda. He has ultimate authority, even over the desires of everyone. And Jesus leaves. They go on his mission to proclaim his message and to cast out demons. Again, Jesus' authority is in action. His authoritative message is, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. So where are you today with Jesus' authority? Is there something you want from Jesus? Why do you come to Jesus? What draws you to him? Is it something you can get, like a healing? Many of us, if we are honest, do not come to Jesus always with the purest of motives. You you see, the gifts he gives us such as eternal life in the presence of God, is a great deal. But we need to remember that second part, in the presence of God. All good things proceed from God because God has ultimate authority and God is ultimate goodness. Many people, upon fear of death 
or fear of Hades or fear of punishment seek God. These are not bad starting points, but they are bad places to stay. God desires you. He desires you to have a relationship with him and enjoy him. When we fail to realize that and just see God as the one who is able to do things for us, we become like the crowd who at one moment enthusiastically follows Jesus and at another moment wants to try to run Jesus off a cliff because they don't like his message or even worse, shout, crucify him. Imagine how sad it would be for a child not to like their parent who has been gone for a long time, but rather like the little toy or trinket brought back. Now imagine you and Jesus. What does his ultimate authority mean to you? Is it something you want to avoid? Jesus, I like you, but Just don't look at this area of my life. I want to have a little freedom to indulge. Or does his ultimate authority mean that Jesus should do all kinds of things for me? That I should enjoy some special privilege that other people don't enjoy? I should get all the toys. Jesus should give me what I want. Or does his ultimate authority become an idol of God? a will without love or reason, a fatalism, whatever God wills, God wills. It doesn't make sense because it shouldn't. And if God asks me to do something that makes no sense, that's a badge of honor. These are all misperceptions of God's authority. They are, it's something to flee, or it's something to get gifts from, or it's something to just follow even though it might be irrational or does his ultimate authority mean that we can rest in the fact that Jesus is in control he will do right and good he will never let our agendas set his agenda which is a good thing our position is to humbly submit and entrust know that the kingdom of God is far greater than either the sum of all the little trinkets we want from God or the indiscretions we want to seek away from God. That simply Christ is our king. And that's a good thing because besides having ultimate authority, he is ultimately good. And he is the word, the logos as John puts it, the divine reason. We have the source of all reason, goodness and love, also having ultimate authority over the universe. We ought to humbly submit. Do we humbly submit? What things easily get in our way? There are many. But remember, the kingdom we are being offered and the kind of king who sits upon the throne. Do you want to submit to that king? Thank you.